This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 25 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you are new to the Homestead Journey, I welcome you. So glad you are with us. If you have been listening for a while, welcome to you as well. I hope you have had a great week. And I am excited today to share with you on this podcast about what's been going on here on 3B Farm and Homestead, as well as um, our main topic today, which is going to be handling adversity on the homestead. If you are new to this podcast, my name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead in beautiful upstate New York. Beautiful upstate New York where it does appear that spring has sprung. And uh, I have just had an opportunity this week to get outside and do some things. It's been a great week on the homestead. So let's jump right into this week's Homestead Happenings. It has been an absolutely awesome week on the homestead. Now, as I'm recording this, obviously the main news of the world really is the coronavirus. Um, But in spite of all of that, we have really been able to focus in this week here on the homestead and really get some things done around here. And as I sit down to this podcast tonight, I record these on Sunday evenings usually, and I just am sitting down to record this feeling very, very accomplished. So this week, first of all, our meat birds arrived, and uh, they arrived happy and healthy. Well, I don't know about happy, um, but they did arrive very healthy. We ordered them, um, as I have done for the last uh, three years, through Valley Farms Hatchery, and uh, I've had really good luck with them. Price-wise, they have been the best value that I have found up to this point. But beyond that, the chicks have just been very healthy, uh, generally speaking. I did have one that arrived um, dead on arrival, DOA. Uh, However, everybody else has been doing great. And that mobile coop, folks, is just working out great as a brooder. I am so happy with that. Uh, Getting those birds out of my garage, oh, you have no idea how much that means to me. Now, I know that's a first world problem, and I should be thankful that I had a place to brood them in the first place, but not having to deal with the dust um, and the mess that the chickens make, uh, getting all over everything in my garage is a blessing. And not just that, but anybody who has dealt with the Cornish Cross knows that they are poop factories. And it won't be long until we will be putting down shavings after shavings after shavings, and still it will seem like it is not enough. Um, They are just amazing little poop factories. And so I am just thankful that that is out of the garage. It it, And and our garage happens to be um, half of our basement. Um, and so I am just glad that that is out there in the mobile coop and just working out very, very well. Our chicks, our layers are doing great. Our turkeys are doing great. It seems like having the turkeys and the meat birds together is doing, uh, is doing great. So, um, that all is just, uh, going gangbusters right now. And I hope it continues to do so. The tomatoes and the peppers are popping up right now. I'm very, very happy with how those are looking. The brassicas are looking really, really great. Won't be long and I'll be able to get those outdoors um, because the brassicas can handle uh, a little cooler temperatures. It'll be a little bit before I get the tomatoes and the peppers outdoors, but they are looking very, very good right now. And uh, I am very happy with that. I also started some herbs inside this year. Uh, First time I've ever done that. I started some basil, some lemon balm, some parsley. I don't even remember all that I started, Um, but some of that is starting to pop up. And so that's very exciting. 
and uh, just really getting excited about the garden this year. We also did some work this week outdoors on our garden. We have uh, the raised beds. Um, I have nine raised beds that we use the square foot gardening method in. And so I topped those off with our homemade compost this weekend. And so those are just about ready to plant. I need to put the grids back on them and uh, then they will be ready to go. And then I did quite a bit of work this weekend um, on the Ruth Stout bed. Those of you who are new to the podcast may not uh, know this, but I'll just kind of bring you up the speed really quickly. We are doing an experiment this year with the Ruth Stout gardening method. Now, the Ruth Stout gardening method is a deep mulch method that predominantly uses hay, although she did say you could use uh, straw and wood chips. Wood chips would be more associated with the back to Eden style of gardening. Ruth Stout was an author back in the 60s and 70s and wrote extensively about this method. And so I've read about it, seen some videos about it. And this year I have prepped a garden bed that's about 28 feet wide by about 40 and a half feet long. And I put down hay last fall. And so this weekend what I did is I actually put up the T-post around it so that I can put some fencing up around it to hopefully keep out the deer and uh, the rabbits and the groundhogs and whoever else might want to get in there and mess things up on me. But also we're contemplating letting our geese and ducks do some free ranging and I wanted to keep them out of the garden. Although some people have used geese and ducks to weed their gardens, I... I don't want to do that. I'm I'm afraid they're going to mow things down. And so we have got uh, the posts up, the T-post around the perimeter. And I'm using the wedge lock bracing system um, on the corners. And then where I'm going to have some gates, what that's supposed to do is to keep the T-post from being pulled over from the tension of the fence. Unfortunately, Tractor Supply was one package short uh, for the the bracing needed on the edge of the gate. And then in my haste to try to, well, force some things, I boogered up one of the ones that I have. So I have got to buy another couple of packages of bracing in order to be able to finish up that project. But it is well underway. All of the posts are driven. And uh, so very very happy about that. It was also a great opportunity to spend some time with my son. And uh, we just had a lot of laughs, um, just had a good time working on that project together, making memories. And uh, to me, that's what it's all about. Now, it is not the prettiest uh, fencing job you've ever done, uh, you've ever seen. Uh, First of all, we have a lot of shale here. And so uh, sometimes you have to kind of shift the, the, T-post a little bit one way or another to be able to drive them in the ground. But then on the other hand, folks, I'm an IT guy. I don't do this um, for a living. And so sometimes it just is what it is and getting it up and getting it in place, uh, you just have to say, well, you know what? It's good enough. And my son kept reminding me that we were not building, I think he called it a carrot garden for the Queen of England. Now, I have no idea what a carrot garden for the Queen of England is, but I will tell you right now, that is not what we're building. And uh, so anyhow, um, just very happy to have the posts driven. It's a good workout. Well, let me tell you something, folks. If you are someone who is bemoaning the fact that your gyms are closed right now during the coronavirus, go outside and drive some T-posts and preferably find some place that has a lot of shale, a lot of rock. That will give you a workout. Let me tell you something. That will give you a workout. Another major thing that I have been doing this week here on the homestead has been trying as as much as I can to be helpful to people on a lot of the Facebook groups and um, homesteading forums. There right now are a lot of people who who are popping in brand new to the ideas of raising and growing food. And I have really been trying to be as helpful to those individuals as possible. Now, some of you may be new to the podcast because I've shared with you links to some of the episodes 
um, that I have done in the past that hopefully have helped answer some of the questions that you were asking. And if you are one of those individuals, welcome to the Homestead Journey podcast. So glad that you are with us. But one of the things that I am really trying to do my best is to share as much knowledge as maybe as limited as it is, but as much knowledge as I have with people who are brand new to the ideas of raising and growing their own food. One of the things that I shared this week was I shared the pictures of the box of meat birds arriving here on our homestead. And it was amazing to me, some of, and and folks, if you ask this question, I am not making fun of you at all. I was very glad to have this question. But sometimes we as homesteaders who have been doing this for a while, we take things for granted. And I had people asking, what's a meat bird? Where do you get them? Um, how you know how are they different than a a, a regular chicken? Um, there are people who are very and, and I don't use this term in a in a derogatory way, so please do not take offense to this. But there are people who are very very ignorant about the very basics, and we as homesteaders, people who have been doing this for a long time, we need to have a lot of grace. We need to have a lot of um, patience, but a willingness to help people and to educate people in a way that is not condescending, in a way that is not rude. Now, I'll be honest with you. I screwed up this week. I did in a major way. I was on a particular hatcheries uh, site uh, or Facebook group, and uh, somebody was kind of, they all caps, you know, it was Karen. Um, I need to speak to the manager, Karen, but instead of talking to the manager at, who I almost gave the hatchery away, I'll say, Hoover Hatchery, they jumped onto Facebook and just let loose because what happened is their chicks arrived dead. And people responded to them, and I did as well, and said, hey, listen, sometimes that happens, and it's not the hatchery's fault. Contact the hatchery. They will do their best to make it right. Um, And, you know, and that was the advice that many, many people were giving them. But there was one individual who replied and said, well, I don't understand why you would ship babies through the mail. You should go on down to the feed store and buy them there. And folks, I had a lapse of judgment. <laughs> I'm going to confess right now. And I went at that person a little bit hard and I said, don't be ignorant. How do you think that those chicks got there in the first place? And then it hit me after, it was a couple hours later, it hit me and said, maybe that person doesn't even know that those chicks were shipped through the mail to the feed store. And so I went back to try to find that post and to apologize to that individual. And it seemed like the individual who started that post had taken it down. And so I I can't go back and undo what I did, but I try to remind myself that we need to have grace, that we need to have patience. We need to be helpful to people not demeaning and not derogatory. You know, one of the things that does frustrate me though to no end, (laughs) there's a lot of people that are coming in and asking, where should I buy my seeds? And folks, I know that you have your favorite seed stores. We all do. I've got my favorite online seed vendor. But right now, my favorite online seed vendor is not taking orders. Fedco Seeds is shut down until I think April 9th, and then they might start taking seed orders. So folks, please get off your favorite seed company soapbox and help people find seed companies that have seeds or else suggest that they do the best they can with what they can find locally. So go to Walmart, go to Home Depot, go to Lowe's, go to Tractor Supply, go to your local hardware store, go to your local feed store. Do the best you can with what you got. This is not the time to get on the non-GMO heirloom seed bandwagon, folks. Get off it already. Oh, driving me nuts. (laughs) So that's what I have been doing this week is really trying to steer people in the direction of, hey, I had one lady that she was interested in a couple of specific varieties. I had pointed her Fedco not realizing that Fedco was shut down. And she responded, hey, Fedco shut down. So I went and found some seed companies that are still shipping that sell the varieties that she was interested in. It took me a little Googling. Didn't take me a whole lot of time. 
but it certainly wasn't being a fanboy of XYZ Seed Company. But a big part of my week this week was really trying to help educate and point as many people in the right direction as possible. Um, Some other things that we've been doing here on the homestead, we actually had some people come this week and pick up some pigs that they purchased from us. And uh, I think these pigs went to a wonderful home, people that will love them and uh, take good care of them. And uh, that's always something for me as a breeder, I'm always concerned about. I had somebody contact me one time and ask me about whether or not, well, they they wanted to buy a pig and uh, they were asking me how they should transport this pig. And they said, well, can I tie its legs together and put it in a duffel bag? Trust me, folks, I did not sell a pig to that person. (laughs) Not going to do it. And so that's one of the things for me as a breeder. I always am a little bit concerned with regards to who I sell animals to. I always want to make sure that they're educated with regards to the differences, the nuances of the American guinea hog, because I want to make sure that my pigs um, are are well taken care of. And yes, I have no problem with them becoming meat. Uh, That's a big part of the reason why we raise pigs, but I want them to have one bad day. Or in the case of the borrows, they're going to have two bad days. I'm sorry, boys. Um, you come out on the short end of the stick. Uh, but I, I just want to be careful that our animals are going to good homes. And I do feel like these did that. And so been in contact with them over the weekend. And it sounds like the pigs have settled in very well there. And so very, very happy about that. That is what's been going on here on the homestead. I mean, there's a lot of other things I could get into. I've been cutting up seed potatoes today, getting ready to put those in the roost out garden bed. Um, A lot of other things going on around here, but those are the highlights. I hope things are going well on your homestead and that your homestead journey is progressing rapidly uh, or maybe slowly, but it is progressing. That's what's important. All right, let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. On this week's Charting the Course, we're going to spend some time talking about handling adversity on the homestead. You know, right now, a lot of us are handling a lot of adversity. Now, one of the things that I have told you before, and I will tell you again, is I do not want to do coronavirus specific topics. Uh, And that's for a number of reasons. First of all, I want this podcast to be as helpful five years from now as it is hopefully today, tomorrow, and the next couple of weeks. But beyond that, I am kind of coronavirus out. But having said that, We cannot ignore that that is a major component of what's going on in our world today and that it is affecting all of us. I don't think there's anybody that has been unaffected by what is taking place in our world with regards to coronavirus. Now, some people, it may be affecting more than others, but it is affecting all of us. And so I was thinking about, actually, I had another totally different topic that I was going to cover on this week's episode, and I've decided to push that off probably for a couple of weeks. But there was actually something that took place in my own life personally this week that I will share with you here in a little bit that really caused me to readjust, shall we say, um, what I was going to talk about on this week's podcast. But but again, not wanting to speak specifically to coronavirus, I really wanted to think about adversity on your homestead in a larger sense. Because folks, if whether you are brand new to homesteading or you are somebody who has been homesteading for your entire life, adversity is a part of life. And Just because homesteading is a great lifestyle and just because homesteading is a lifestyle that some people refer to a more simpler life, although I I don't like that description, but anyhow, that doesn't mean that it 
that homesteading isn't without adversity. Adversity is going to come. So whether it's coronavirus or whether it's the, the loss of an animal or whether it's the loss of a job or whether it's uh, the loss of, of a loved one, um, when you are faced with adversity on your homestead, how should you respond? First of all, I think we need to keep in mind that it is okay to mourn our losses. Now, that's something that kind of flies in the face of what almost as kids has been ingrained in us, right? Don't cry over spilled milk. Keep a stiff upper lip. You know, big boys don't cry. All of those kinds of things. And I think, folks, we need to just get to a place where we allow ourselves to mourn our losses. Now, I'm not talking about throwing a years-long pity party and all of those kinds of things, but we just need to be okay with being sad about things, mourning losses. You know, that really is what I faced this week that caused me to kind of change my direction with regards to this podcast. The Meat Birds arrived this, this week. My mom and dad and I... Um, pooled our resources, so to speak, and we ordered uh, chicks together. And so I took my chicks out, put them in the brooder, and then I proceeded to take my mom and dad's chicks up to them. And I pulled into the driveway, and that usually, that sight of pulling into my mom and dad's house is a sight that brings me so much joy and so much happiness. I'm going to go into their home. It's not the house that I was raised in. It's not like I have those sentimental attachments to it. But on the other hand, that's my mom and dad's house. It's a place of love. It's a place of peace. It's a place where we get together and we have laughs and we cry together. And it's just, it's a loving place. And it's just a place that when I, I arrive, I'm happy to see my mom and dad. I'm, I'm very blessed that I have a great relationship with my mom and dad. And yet this was a time where instead of it bringing me happiness and bringing me joy, it brought me a great amount of sadness because I, I took the chicks to the, to the coop and I put them in there. My dad wasn't home yet from work. And then instead of going indoors and sitting down and chatting with my mom as I normally would, I sat in my truck and I cried like a baby. I wept because of that loss. Now, maybe that makes me less of a man. I don't know. Quite frankly, I don't care. But I sat there and I mourned that loss in a way that I hadn't mourned that loss up to this point. Folks, we are going to face losses on our homestead. It may be the loss of an animal. You know, many people are starting to understand that for the first time in their lives. They're getting chicks and chicks are arriving from a hatchery and they didn't make it. Um, they're putting chicks in their brooder and they're not, uh, this is the first time they've ever raised chicks and chicks are dying and they're trying to understand what did I do wrong and and they're all worked up about it. And we as, again, people who have been doing this for a while, we need to understand that it's okay for people to mourn those losses. Now, sometimes we flippantly say, well, if you have livestock, eventually you're going to have dead stock. And that is absolutely true. There are times when chicks die and you did absolutely nothing wrong. There are times when pigs die and you did absolutely nothing wrong. There are times when hawks come in and they get your hens and you did absolutely nothing wrong. And it's okay to mourn those losses. Yes, those kinds of losses, it's a part of homesteading. If you do have livestock, eventually you will have dead stock. But those of us who have been doing this a while, maybe we've become a bit numb to that. And we have people who are 
the first time ever having to face those kinds of things. We need to have a little bit of grace, a little bit of patience, and help them understand that it's okay to mourn those losses. And I don't know what it is that you've lost. Maybe you've lost a job. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you've lost a way of life. It's okay, folks, to mourn those losses. I think that's step number one. But we can't stop there. I think step number two is that we need to count our blessings. Now, I have been raised in the church since I was a wee little lad. (laughs) <laughs> and there's a simple song that we used to sing, count your blessings, name them one by one. And I think sometimes, folks, we need to get our eyes off of what we've lost, and we need to get our eyes on what we have. Now, in the midst of this coronavirus thing that's going on, yes, maybe we've lost some freedom to move about, but maybe you've gained some time with your kids. Maybe you, instead of having to run around and do all of this sports stuff, maybe you have some opportunities to play board games with your kids in ways that you've never had an opportunity to play board games with your kids. Maybe your kids are seeing you for the first time cook from scratch because due to the sports stuff where you were running around all the time, you were eating fast food. And now all of a sudden, they're having some memories be made in your family unit of mom or dad actually cooking a meal and you sitting down as a family unit and eating a meal together in ways that you never have before. Maybe this is the first time they've ever seen mom bake bread or dad make pancakes. And so in the midst of all of this, yes, we mourn our losses, but let's get our eyes onto the things that we have gained, on the blessings that we have. We have an opportunity as homesteaders to raise and grow our own food. I think that's awesome. And maybe you're doing that for the first time, and maybe your kids are going to experience that for the first time. And that is something, folks, that you should cherish. That is something that is awesome. And that is something that I think has great value. You know, when I was growing up, I remember many, many occasions where we would go out and we would do something as a family or maybe, I I don't know, but, but sometimes it would go horribly wrong. And we would get to the other side of that. And my dad would look at us and he would say, well, boys, we sure made memories today. And, 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 you know, some of my best memories that I have came in the midst of adversity. Some of my most cherished memories that I have as a family came in difficult times. And so, folks, my challenge to you, yes, mourn your losses, but then focus on the blessings that you have, on the positive things that you have on your homestead. Maybe you've lost all of your chickens to a predator. Those things happen. But you've got a great garden. Maybe you've lost your tomatoes to tomato hornworm, but you've got a good crop of lettuce. Right? So think about the things that you do have and get your eyes off of maybe the adversity that you are confronting. The third piece of advice I would have for you is a piece of advice I saw from a friend of mine this week on Facebook. It's actually my brother's brother-in-law, but he shared a meme that said, don't panic, pivot. I love that. Don't panic, pivot. In the midst of all of this uncertainty that we have going on right now, we could sit and panic. And folks, there have been moments when I have been tempted to do that. But on the other hand, this is also an opportunity for us to really lean into the homesteading lifestyle, to really further our homesteading journey. On one of the groups that I'm a member of on, uh, on MeWe, um, we were chatting a couple of days ago about how this has changed some of our perspectives or some of our plans for our homestead. Now, I know a lot of us 
back at the beginning of 2020 had great grand and glorious plans for our homestead. It was going to be the best year ever. And I I hope that it still can be. I'm not saying that it won't be, but I, I do guarantee you this. I don't think any of us had this particular situation as part of our homestead goals for 2020. Now, there are a number of things that I think I shared with you in the course of this podcast, some plans that I had for 2020 that I have decided not to do. I am going to pivot. I'm not going to panic. I'm going to pivot. So money that I would have put into, for example, putting stone into my driveway, right now I am going to take that money and I am going to put it into food production. I'm just pivoting my homestead goals. There were some other things that I was going to do around here that I have decided I'm going to hold off on because I want to take that money, that that effort, that time, and I want to focus on ensuring that I am raising and growing as much food as I can. So it's an, it's not that I'm panicking, it's that I'm pivoting, right? So No matter whether it's this coronavirus situation that we've got going on, or maybe it's that your tomatoes uh, have been taken out by blight, or um, maybe you've lost your chickens to a hawk, don't panic. Pivot. Figure out, okay, maybe I've lost my tomatoes. Can I pull those up? And can I plant something else there that maybe is a quicker growing crop, but I'll still be able to realize some kind of a harvest from that particular area. Okay, I've lost my chickens. Maybe I I need to get quail because quail are going to be a little bit more quicker to lay eggs and to produce meat. And so the advice that I share with you is the advice that I read from my brother's brother-in-law. Don't panic. Pivot. The last thing I would say is Don't let adversity make you bitter. Let it make you better. Now, that's something that probably many of us have heard. It's not unique to me. I don't know where I heard that for the first time. But don't let bad situations make you bitter. Let them make you better. Are there lessons that you can learn from this? Sometimes when animals die, it is our fault. Maybe we had the temperature in the brooder incorrect. We had it too hot or we had it too cold. Maybe we didn't feed our animals the correct diet. Maybe we fed them too much. Maybe we fed them too little. What is it that we can learn from the situation that will help us do better the next time around? Folks, that's one of the tough parts of homesteading is sometimes you're going to make mistakes. And when you make mistakes, animals die and crops fail. And you can let that make you bitter. You can let that just make you throw your hands up in the air and quit. Or you can learn from it and it allow it to make you better. To be a better homesteader, to be a better farmer, a better gardener, a better whatever. Learn from your mistakes. Now, I think the best thing you can do is learn from other people's mistakes. That's certainly, you know, I've heard people say the best way to learn is from your mistakes. I say, no, 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 no. The best way to learn is from other people's mistakes. And that's why I want to keep it real here on the Homestead Journey podcast, because I want you to be able to learn from my mistakes so that you don't make the same mistakes that I have made. But there are... The, the fact of the matter is, you may not make the same mistakes that I make, but you're going to make mistakes. And that's okay. You know, there are some people who they, they uh, because of a mistake they made, they, uh, you know, a chick dies, an animal dies, whatever. And they're like, well, I'm never getting chicks again. I'm never getting pigs again. I'm never going to do this again because I'm a horrible, horrible person. No, no, folks. Unfortunately, sometimes that is the reality of what happens on the homestead. But don't let it make you bitter. Let it make you better. I was chatting with uh, another um, content creator this week. And, uh, you know, I I mentioned to her that kind of my philosophy is ABL. Always be learning. 
You know, I don't know everything, folks. I'm going to be the first one to admit that. I've told you over and over and over again on this podcast, and I will continue to reiterate this. I don't claim to be an expert in anything. I am always learning. And so, folks, in the middle of adversity, sometimes things don't go according to plan. Sometimes it's our mistake. Sometimes it's situations or circumstances outside of our control. But instead of allowing it to make us bitter, allow that situation to make us better. Folks, I really want to encourage you, whether you've been on this homestead journey for years or you have been on this homestead journey for hours or days, I really want to encourage you to just keep doing your best. Understand that adversity is going to come. It's just a fact of life. But when things don't go according to plan, mourn your losses, count your blessings, don't panic, but pivot, and don't get bitter, get better. All right, folks, I hope that you have found this helpful If you have any questions, I again, I have been doing my best to scour the homesteading groups uh, as I have had time to try to answer the questions of people who are new to homesteading, new to gardening, new to raising animals. Uh, But if there is something in particular that you have a question about, you can reach out to me by sending an email to the homestead journey podcast at gmail.com or we are on Instagram. And on Facebook, you can find us there and you can contact me. Uh, You can send me messages, reply to any of the posts that we put up. I try to keep uh, updated, you know, updating everybody on what's going on here on the homestead at least once a day. Don't always get that done. Uh, But find us there. If you've got questions, let me know. I am more than happy to try to help you on your homestead journey as you are on the journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like it, share it. Uh, If you can, go to your favorite podcast player and leave me a review. Um, If you think I'm doing a great job, I would love to hear that. If you think I suck as a podcaster. I'd love to know that too because my goal is to try to get better at doing this. And again, if you've got questions or there's content that you would love to hear, let me know that and I will do my best to either answer you directly or to create an episode to try to answer your questions. As always, the music on this episode is provided by Audionautics.com. So thank you to them. A big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody. Keep up the good work.